and she had a bundle she wanted to present to Prime Minister uh, uh, Justin Trudeau. And in a very emotional moment, she was very moved to give that presentation. So I hope she talks a bit about that. But uh, she's got some uh, some paper in front of her to uh, to guide her way, and she holds her eagle feather. She's very very strong in her culture, strong in uh, her way of life, and obviously very strong in that responsibility she carries as a Shkini Kwe, as a Nishinaabe Kwe Wab Kwe, in the work that she and the responsibility she has there. So uh, please welcome Autumn Peltier. I am going to uh, introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, Edward George is Turtle Clan. He's from Saugeen, uh, uh, First Nation on Lake Huron. He's also a representative of the Ontario First Nations Young People's Council and is a, a learner in Anishinaabe and Win. He uh, followed alongside uh, Josephine uh, during the final water walk, picking up the bundles canoe journey from Duluth, Minnesota to Matane, Quebec. Welcome, Edward George. Yeah, yeah. And last but not least, uh, we've heard her talk a lot and we've seen the leadership she has. And it's been fun uh, talking with uh, Josephine over uh, over this week because I was uh, happened to be there when she first picked up this uh, responsibility. Not as women, she's always kept that responsibility to speak for that water. But when she was given that uh, that vision to, uh, to walk the Great Lakes, I was happy to have been there. And uh, I spoke this morning the importance of men to, to, to be uh, uh, supportive of that. So this isn't just a talk for women and to reinforce the importance of women to uh, do that work for the water. Us men have to be responsive as well. Josephine is a citizen and a, a member of the Wakamakong on Seedon Indian Reserve. She resides in Thunder Bay. She's held a number of positions uh, in different organizations over the years. Um, she is our, uh, she's of our, of our grandmother's council on the Three Fires Medewin Lodge and uh, faithful uh, doorkeeper of our, of our Three Fires uh, Society. So please welcome Josephine Mendelman. So they're going to moderate their own panel, so Autumn's going to speak first and then I think we're going to go down the line. So welcome Autumn Pelchi. Um, I was trying to um, think of some inspiring words to say, but like all I could think about was the image of my auntie Josephine on her last water walk. And in that image, um, I just see her and then and just how thinking that I'm I'm going to be um um, carrying on the work she, she's doing today when she can't anymore. And when I, when I, every time I look at that picture and I keep picturing inside my head, it makes me realize how much the women need to pick up the water bundles and carry on this work for her, but not only her, for Mother Earth and the water. I started this work at a really young age, um, but I realized the importance of, of this work we all need water. We all come from water. We were born in water, from water. We lived in water for nine months, and literally without water, we would all die. None of us would be here. And that's why it's so important to protect our, our water. Water is sacred. Water is alive. The water has a spirit. And the water needs our voice to help her because she's crying out for our help. It's so important to teach our young girls and our women the sacredness of water. It's never too early and it's never too late. It's never too late to learn these um, teachings about our water. Because our first teachings, like I said before, our first teaching was water. The time is now, not next month or next year. Water needs our help today. It's the least we could do, as water sustains us and this and the whole planet. Um, as Bob mentioned before, 
I delivered a gift to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau last year. Um, in that time that I had, I told him that I was unhappy with the choices he'd made and broken promises to my people. And then I started crying, and he said that he'll protect the water. This work I'm doing is not for me. It's for my Auntie Josephine. It's for my people. It's for our animals, our land, and our water, and Mother Earth. Pledge. Um, I'm always impressed with what you have to say and the bravery that you show to everyone. You know, um, we all see you as a symbol, you know, of that continuity of this of this work. And you know, as a Shkali, it's, it's always awesome to see you moving through this world unafraid, um, especially with the support you have from your family. It's just the community is just awesome. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Edward George, which is a really strange name to have. Uh, my Nishnabe name, my real name is Wase Pong, and it was given to me by uh, a grandmother named Mary Sinwe in, uh, from Sagamuk First Nation. And um, that name is when the lightning fills the sky at night, you know, and all of a sudden it looks like daylight. And so that's what my name I was given. Um, and recently I was given a teaching about, you know, our purpose in this world is directly tied with the spirit name that we carry. And that every spirit name is unique in its own way because we are all our own people on our own journeys. Um, I wanted to begin sharing a story most recently that happened to me. Um, I was going this this journey, I'll, I'll get to the journey and uh, kind of how I started to help. And that's why I say Shikabe was named out, because I'm just here to help. And um, to answer a call that was put out, not only to the young women or not only to um, other grandmothers or other women, but seeing this work all these years, you know, there there is a place for men in that, is to be a support and to lift the voices of the women who've been doing the work. And as we know, I recently just heard an elder talk about the roles of women and how the inherent rights that we have are carried in the women. The women are the ones carrying our future. They're the ones that are mothering our nation and uh, bringing us forward. So as men, we have to always be reminded of our place. And that's alongside the women, supporting them watching over them, making sure that they're able to do what they've come here to do. And so in that I feel uh, very privileged to be sitting next to Autumn and also my mother Josephine here. And um, when we first met, we we kind of uh, had a bond, Josephine and I, just a, a silent, unspoken bond. And, I attribute that to how I was raised with my own grandmother and uh, the people that raised me and that kind of lonesomeness that you feel when, you know, for in my family many of the language speakers are now gone and uh, in the south, southwestern Ontario we're really struggling down there with, with that. And so when I met Josephine it was almost like meeting an old friend, like meeting somebody that we, that we hadn't seen each other in so many years and there was all this catching up to do. and. Uh, and the catching up was the work, and and uh, I like I like putting my hands to the work because that's where the best learning comes from. So, anyways, um, we sometimes we don't realize really what we're getting ourselves into. We we have a, this energy. We want to just go ahead and okay, we got to change the world. We got to do something for the water, you know, and uh, and help, right? But when you really put yourself, your mind, like your intention and your heart into something. It has an ability or there's an opportunity where your life can be changed, be transformed. And, um, and that's kind of where, what I've been going through recently this uh, past winter. All the things that we saw on the water. And sometimes it was really challenging because there's 
very few places left where we can be openly free and wild and let our hearts, you know, connect with the land and the water. And I always feel that we're being petitioned by our grandmothers to do just that, go and sit on the land, go and, go and be there and, and uh, understand what the natural world's telling us. You know, and like what I'm saying, the water's calling out, it's crying out, you know. And, it's, and all these prayers that are given and all these things that are brought forward, what happens when we give our tobacco? We know that it will travel and it will do its work and it will make it to the Creator and the Creator will sit with it and look at it and understand where it's coming from and then the creation, the Creator will answer you. That tobacco will always be answered. This is what we've been told, right? And so, what happens then after all these years of working for the water and walking and, and praying, you know, what happens when the Spirit turns around now is petitioning us in return? We've petitioned the Spirit, we've asked for help and guidance and to know what to do. Now creation is, I believe, we're in this time that creation is answering that, that, that question. And everybody's feeling that call, that pull to start protecting the water, to start protecting the last pieces that we have as Anishinaabeg. You know, um, we're under threat, you know, our language, our ways of life, you know. Everybody seems to want what we have and we barely had a chance to, you know, return these bundles and these knowledges back to our own communities. And uh, as I was uh, here, I kind of showed up a, a day early, and so I had a chance to kind of go around and listen and observe. And um, there's actually a youth training on HIV just down the road, and I got to go and listen to what they had to say. It made me realize, like, the young people already know what to do. All their recommendations on the wall said, holy man, imagine if we had the resources to just do it. You know, they, they already know what, what, what they need. And in the same way, our ancestors and our elders already figured out a lot of things for us. And so now I think what we're just being asked to do is just to do it. And I'll give you an example. Um, this past winter, like first of all, I want to acknowledge that where we are right now in this time of year. There's a lot of suffering going on in our communities. We're losing a lot of people. Um, mental health in this time of year is always something we have to really be diligent or vigilant and watch our people. Uh, I just lost somebody to suicide a few days ago. Um, and when you, when you say, tell, say I'm a helper, you can't, you can't really say no to certain things, eh? And it's been a challenge to learn how to be a better helper. And sometimes we have to take that time out to sit and really reflect. And that's why I wanted to acknowledge where we are right now. We're in a, a really blessed time where creation is resting. And we live in a world where we're not really resting anymore. And this time of year is really sacred to us because we can tell our stories and we can um, and send forward those prayers for the coming, the coming season, right? And there's a lot of work to do. And, um, I was going to go and see a healer uh, in another town, like an hour away, and I was having a hard time getting there because I missed the bars, then I missed the train, and the next thing you know, this huge fog just comes over the whole city, like thick fog. And it reminded me of being on the water sometimes when you're out there, then all of a sudden you can see it like just way out there, and then all of a sudden it's coming and it's coming, and then it just swallows you whole, and you're just completely covered in this like, this water, you know, and you can't see anything around you, and it, it took me back for a minute, you know, being there, and I was like, wow, I, I guess I'm not meant to go anywhere. Here I was even going to hitchhike just to try to get where I needed to go to do some internal work, eh? And everybody was off the roads because you couldn't see, so I walked all the way out for nothing and turned around. I was getting tired, and uh, I just wanted to walk, so I was heading through this park, and um, there was a man laying down by the bench, face first in the snow. And his little bike was sitting there, and it was just such a strange image. It was like, you know, this, why is this man laying here? And so I go up to him, and I try, try to feel like, hey, buddy, are you all right? Are you all right? 
and he wouldn't wake up. And so uh, I felt this pulse. There was something little big. And so I had to check to see if his chest was moving. Um, and it wasn't apparent, so I had to like turn him over. And as I turned him over, his mouth was blue. And his eyes rolled back to his head, and he was overdosing. And about every 35 seconds, he would make this like, <coughs> and that was it. And, you know, I didn't really, I just knew what to do, just get on him and start the compressions, right? And I called the ambulance for the uh, first responders and they, sh they showed up. And um, we don't really know how long he had been there laying like that, um, but they used naloxone to revive him. And they hooked him right up and there was about eight. There was uh, a couple firefighters, the police, and then the paramedics. So there was eight highly trained professionals to come and respond to his name who had been overdosing. And, um, he was revived and he came back and of course if anybody's seen that before they come back and it's almost like they never even did drugs to begin with like, and he didn't want to go to the hospital he said i'm fine and we kept asking him what did you take what did you take and he wouldn't answer and they told me that you're not or they're not allowed to make somebody go to the hospital in those situations it's their own freedom you can't force them but i wondered i said Really, is, is he capable right now to make that kind of choice? It's the same with somebody who is drinking and driving. Like, obviously, they're too intoxicated to drive. They shouldn't be driving. This person in their own vessel can't drive their own vessel right now. Should they really be left out in the cold, in the snow? And I, and I don't know what came over me. I was just completely like, there is no way you guys are just going to leave him here. Look at him. He's thirsty. He's hungry. We don't know where he lives. You guys are all paid very good money to care. You're not just paid to do your job. You're all paid to care. And I refuse, as somebody who lives in this city, to allow this to happen. I'm going to sit here until I know, you know, in 20 minutes or in an hour, if he's going to be okay. Because with naloxone, you know, really, really, you know? And he was a shamash man, you know? He was just a regular, he was too young anyways. You know, and it, and it took me back to times where I've seen this in my life and maybe at a certain time I wasn't capable to be in that moment, to take that moment on and, and to say I'm going to be here for somebody else. And um, especially a stranger, you know. And uh, so I, this part of the story is to encourage everybody to get naloxone too because you just never know when that was going to happen. And fentanyl is on the rise. like. In, that, in the city of London, there was there's already been four fentanyl overdoses since 2018. You know, so it's like it's it, we're in an epidemic, right? And and we have to create that care, that kind of care that you know that our ancestors gave to us. And we may be reluctant right now too to continue giving, but that's what's required. You know, we have to be generous as much as we don't want to. And I learned that through working with Josephine. Um, being her, one of her little ducklings, you know. Uh, she has a really gentle way of teaching. She won't tell you what to do or what to think. She'll just, you know, she'll listen to you and she'll like, encourage you, but she won't spoon feed you. She'll make you do the work, you know. And so in that kind of way, as I, I was always trying to go through my own personal healing and, and self-work, that fog came and I was prevented from going. And here on my way home, a man's life was in need. And I was able to be there in that moment. And so that was a teaching about what it means to be a Shabbos, how to be a helper, is how to give your, even if you might be in need yourself. Like we had a big year, a very big year, and we saw a lot and we felt like I felt, went through a lot, passing by six nuclear power plants, mines, um, massive ships on the St. Lawrence, the whole St. Lawrence system is damned. And it's a lot. Like what we're doing, our negligence, as Josephine always says, like by us doing nothing, we're actually doing a lot. We're actually saying that this is all okay. And to go through that and face and see those things, it, it really took a toll on my on me. You know, and so in my own personal healing, thinking I really needed some help, really know somebody else needed help, and that our, and to learn that our suffering is no greater or no less than anybody else. 
And when you give, when you really give in that Nishnaga way, there's a blessing that is returned to you in kind. You don't do it for that blessing. You don't do it for your own healing. You do it because your heart is there and you've been called and you've answered that call. And we don't know why. None of us knew what we are getting ourselves into. <laughs> Following those feet, you know. We did it. And, uh, but what a blessing, you know, to have that faith, you know, to cultivate faith over a period of time of three months and trying to maintain ceremonies, you know, a challenge because we're all human, we have needs, and uh, we have good teachers to follow who, who have that integrity and that commitment to keep things about the water, to keep things about the continuity of life, you know, whether that's a homeless man in the city of London who is dying because of, you know, fentanyl, you know, or whether it's these animals and, you know, what we saw, like, in southwestern Ontario, there's really nowhere left for these animals to go. They all flock to those provincial parks. They're like little reserves for animals. And then I realized, hey, that's what happened to our people. We all put on reserves, you know, and we have to, then we have to change our reality. And that's why, and, and that's why a lot of people don't really want to live there anymore because it's hard. It's hard to see the truth of what we've done to this planet. You know, it's hard to face that voice that says the water is calling out. To hear that call, to be like, I'll be that person to stand up. That's hard. And and I look at everybody in this room, and I've, I've heard people here to and the work that you're doing. You know, to carry that weight. Oftentimes we're alone, working to try to help our people to get better. You know, we need these opportunities now to come together and have that group hug to lift ourselves up. Especially now in this time of year where a lot of people are struggling. And so my message, you know, the work, the, the water brought me is a conduit for life. It has life, it gives life, it is alive. And, and that's why we want it. We have a big vision and there's a lot of work um, that we're doing leading up to next year's plant gathering. Um, and there's a whole story there that I could go into. I just want to be cognizant of the time. We're okay? Lots of time? Okay, great. So maybe I'll share a little bit about that. Because um, I was given a vision. And uh, in 2016, I paddled to the Great Lakes Gathering. And I asked a really simple question. You know, what more do we have to do? What more is needed? Because I know what we're doing is a start, and I know what we're doing is, is, is good and is needed. But what more do we have to do? We're in trouble. And uh, nothing came back at first. But then after I said, okay, whatever you want me to do, I will do it without question. And I, I wouldn't really encourage anybody to do that. Because <laughs> then you don't, you don't really know what you're getting yourself into. And so it's been a big learning curve for me this last while is to understand what I'm being asked to do, as that Shikabe was saying, uh, which is to bring together our people. So this past while, I've been really learning about the ways that we are divided as people, and how to create and hold that space so that we can come back together. Because we're not trying to fight each other. You know, say for example, the Indian X system, or the Nishnabe way. We're not, there's no reason to fight. There's no reason to remain divided because we're in this reality in this time and age right now, together no matter what. And we have good things about, you know, our systems that we're building, we have good things about what's always been there. And that's where the clan system comes in, because right now we are struggling to make collective decisions. We're struggling to really get down to making sure our children don't go into care. We're having a hard time building homes in our communities so our women can come home and our families can come home. Our population's exploding, you know, and we're we're being tasked to rebuild our nation every day. And whether we whether you realize it or not, you're part of that, you know. And, and so I've been learning about about these things. And this vision came from the water, and what I understand was how do you put it to words? Like um, I don't need. I don't need you to heal me. I don't need you to uh, do any of those things. It's used. It's us that needs to 
look at our own emotions. It's us that needs to change our relationships with each other. If we change that water that's inside of us, that's how we get back to that the health of our nation. So it's all that water is all connected, right? And um, so I've been working uh, with some people, some really awesome people, to share uh, this vision and share. And, and create this gathering next year, which is going to be happening uh, August 15th to 19th in southwestern Ontario. And we're bringing together uh, a grandmother's council, and we're bringing together grandfathers to help guide us in a good way. Oftentimes, um, we struggle to come together and have these kind of conversations and create this, uh, what do they call it, brave space not just safe spaces, but brave spaces, where we can really examine what's going on with us, where we can really come together as people and, and come back to that, what we were given a, um, to help guide us through, through the ages, you know, to help us take care of each other and make decisions. And so that's my work. This is going to be my work. And um, in that place, like, as a young man, as a helper, you know, I have the energy now to do this, and we we can't wait. That's what we're being told. We can't wait any longer to take this step, the steps that we need to rebuild our nation. When they made treaties, it was with the British Crown and the Shawnee. You know, it wasn't with Canada. Right? We were a nation, and we are inside here. But how do we take that step out? Right? And I feel that if we get to that place, that's how we can really make an impact for the water. Because the choices that we make, we'll, we'll have those women right there at the center saying, what about the water? What about the future children? You know? So we have, to, we have to build that. And uh, I'm committed as ever, as much as it's been a big learning curve, I'm committed as ever to doing that. And um, that vision was, uh, I was given the blessing to do that at the Great Lakes Gathering by an elders council uh, that was convened there. And it was all on the land, all on the water, all in ceremony that this vision, uh, I was given the permission to go ahead and, and, and to work on that. And so, in the meantime, we, we went on this canoe journey and like I said, we saw quite a bit of things. And I've been spending this last while. Um, we were t we were uh, teasing each other, like, "Hey, I think I'm a little bit nervous to come and talk to everybody because <laughs> I don't really know what I could tell you that would get you all up and and get you in a canoe and go and check out check out what I'm telling. Like, I I can't, I just can't give it to you. You have to get up and go and and just try a little bit and just get a taste." You know, just get a feel for that because there's such a freedom in traveling in a canoe. There's so much you learn about navigating life. All the navigating you got to do is actually a, a really great teaching about the navigation through our life trail, right? And, and some of these situations that we find ourselves in, especially through the Indian Act, especially in health, especially in you know these areas where everything was designed for us to not be successful. You know, this was designed for us not to make it. We were supposed to all blend into the into the rest of society, you know. And and that's still a, that's still a risk, a very real risk today, where we're being asked into these uh, agreements and uh, situations where we're jeopardizing the future decision making of people that never even made it yet. Here, we have to think about them. It's not just a coin of phrase being the seventh generation to someone. It's an honor and it's an incredible responsibility to recognize that at one point in time, somebody thought of me, somebody loved me, somebody thought of you, somebody loved you, enough that they made a decision that enabled us to be here right now. I think that's an honor. But it is also a responsibility to think about these young people, think about, you know, especially um, people who are two-spirited, you know, people that 
um, were taken away by CAS and were just now finding their way home. You know, we have a lot of people who are of our nation who aren't here right now. Like, there's a lot of empty chairs. And let's just say for a minute that those are all the people that we're thinking of, that we want to we wanna make that space for, and we want to bring them home. You know, and that's the role of our society, the role of our people is, uh, in our clan system, it would be the bears. Because it would all be the bears, you know, taking care of, watching, thinking about uh, the health and well-being of our nation, of our communities. And that's why I, I look at you with admiration and respect, because I know what carrying a bundle is like. The work that you're doing is like a bundle. And you care for it, and you, you work on it. You come to these conferences, and you and you learn, and you, and you find new ways to, to help, right? And sometimes, like I said, we're working in silos, and like, you know, try to just, you know, uh, get creative and like, you know, deliver on the things that we're, we've been charged with, that we're responsible for. And um, where, I, where I'm coming from is in my heart, right? Eh? And um, sometimes it's a challenge to be in that place, you know, because you can't just turn away from the suffering. You can't just pretend that everything's all good. Even though it, there are good things and there's awesome things happening, we have to re remember that um, pe some people don't have a voice. You know, some people don't have access. They're not able to access these things, say. Especially ceremony. Especially ceremony. You know, the lodges that we belong to, whether you're Medellin, Brain Dance, Long Known, you know, um, Sundance, you don't even have to be of a lodge. You know, there's a lot of people who grew up in the church and praise the Lord, and that's like awesome too, right? Um, but these are for our healing. That's what they're for. And in a, in a big way, they're for our healing. You know, and as we come together, we have to recognize that when we make decisions about our own healing, we have to be respectful of everybody's ways of life. And we have to make ways for them to be accessible for our people. And they have to be opening and kind and understanding. Have that, you know, when we say joy no shnam, it's not pity, it's compassion. Have compassion for us. And there's a lot of young people. I've been working a lot with youth suicides as well recently, and um, yeah, there's a lot of young people that don't have their voices heard, and they feel alone. They don't feel like people care. Right? And we know we, we know how that feels. Um, and I don't want to discourage you. So I just uh, I need to be real with where we're at because this is where my heart's at, and this is where my commitment. I didn't realize getting into this that this is where it would take me. <laughs> That's what I said. To you. You've got to be clear with your intent because you can go all over the place, right? And, and this learning, this incredible learning that came from, you know, following uh, these women and being that helper, you know, it's taken to me, taken me to incredible highs and, and incredible lows. And um, through that, you know, they say, you know, the they when you really know what it is to live, you know, that's when that, you know, that's when it comes to you, that feeling. And so I'm really interested, how do we bring that feeling more and more, you know, because uh, we have to extend the generosity that, we were, that we've been given, you know, with our teachings and um, our ceremonies. Hmm. And I, 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 uh, I'm really thankful, I just need to say uh, to Josephine as well, because she went through a lot of um, adversity and through this work, through all these years, and um, she has this unrelenting vision, very straightforward, and I'm always that person that I forget my, uh, uh, my friend, uh, one of he says yesterday, you have a very ambitious mind. <laughs> let just I let myself go there, right? And to Josephine, she always says, oh yeah, that's real simple. It's real simple. And I'm just like, and then she'll tell me, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like, yeah, you're right, it's simple. 
got to put it like that, right? And so part of this is really, really simple. You know, what we have to do is really simple. And it starts with uh, cleaning ourselves off, taking a step back, you know, and uh, beginning to listen again. We're always being petitioned. Like I said, we're in this time where we're being petitioned to pick up those bundles, to pick up those responsibilities. And, and it's up to all of us. Like, the question that Josephine asked, what are you going to do about it? Is what I'm, again, extending to all of you. What are you going to do? There's an opportunity that's been in waiting for many years. And um, are you ready to pick up that bundle? You know? And um, I want to leave you with that. Think about it, you know? Because the generations are here, they're coming, you know, you got to be ready. And so uh, with that, I want to thank you for your time and your attention. And I'll help you <laughs> much. Oh, okay, so she wants me to give you guys a quick rundown of how the, the clan's gathering is going to go. Because um, there people have a lot of questions. Um, and we've been doing a lot of listening. My sister, she was back there a little while ago, but she's been helping us organize clan gatherings and uh, sharing the clan teachings, but also uh, this vision. And a gathering is the most tangible way I can bring this into the physical world. So I've asked Josephine to head um, or go around and search for grandmothers, seven grandmothers from each clan family. To, and what we've asked them is over this winter to consider all of these things that we've heard. So for example, in ceremonies or in gathering spaces, when we come together in collectives, sometimes uh, the women don't feel safe or they don't feel that their role is equal or that that space that they need to do their work is there. So how do we create that space? The other one is, uh, I've been given tobacco for two-spirit people, trans people. How do they come you know, into this setting? What about the people that don't have a clan? What about the elders? How do we take care of them? And so we have a bunch of questions for them, and the grandmothers themselves will be the ones to make those common protocols so that everybody feels welcome, accepted, and safe. This gathering isn't going to be very heavy. It's not going to be where like you get up at sunrise and you're there all day just you know really suffering. <laughs> we want it to be like a homecoming, actually like a family vacation, because our people like to have fun and enjoy themselves too, right? So we can't always be real serious. So what we're proposing is to have clan teachings half a day, and then the rest of the day, the land that we that's chosen us really uh, is so beautiful. There's a river. There's all these trails, there's like gorgeous dunes, and over on the other side of the dunes, there's like Huron. Beautiful, beautiful beach, sandy, sandy beach. It's gonna be in the height of summer, so your families are welcome. There will be that space for single parents. There will be that space for all of our people. Like we were very dedicated to that part. The other part of this is, um, we don't, we're not against anything. We're not, we're only for raising our people up. We're only for empowering and coming to that collective place. So we're gonna work for these things, not against anything. So we've been learning how do we create that space with the system that we already follow, right? And, and that's kind of where I'm going with the grandfathers and to ask them how do we put things back together. And uh, so the first two days is gonna be clan teachings and uh, half a day and then the other half a day you can go uh, enjoy either the canoe races, which we're going to be hosting, and there's going to be a huge prize board for playing our canoe races. It's going to be a lot of fun. And there's going to be family activities, and I'm hoping like our old Indian gambling games too, like the stick games, like the medicine games. And then the third day and the fourth day, we're going to be coming together in a bigger all together. And there's a few things there that um, as we go along, will become really clear what, what we might have to do. And I really feel like this is going to be a big lesson for us, for everybody, a learning opportunity for us to see where we're, where we're at. You know, what's the state of our nation? How much work do we have to do to get to that place where we're actually standing on our own two feet? You know, and, and oftentimes we're, um, 
we're challenged because of the system that we're in. You know, we're not properly resourced or supported. You know, we're, we're often not on our own. You know, or at the very end of the fiscal year or something, you know, like, so how, and, you know, here, as, as clans, as people, we all have those roles and responsibilities to take care of our people, certain parts, eh? So how do we, how do we reinstate those things? And so, um, is there any more, am I forgetting anything? Is that good? Okay, <laughs> she just wanted me to share a little bit more about it. So we are thinking about everybody, you know, because we, we believe that, you know, the system that was given to us really should be, should be there, our language should be right there, you know, and um, what would be different if we were all sitting on the land with a fire? What, what's there waiting for us, you know? Those animals, uh, I was given a uh, teaching recently and they said, hey, you, you know, they always ask, like, those, who, who are those seven grandfathers? You know, the, some, you know the, they're old men, eh? And I was like, yeah, I guess they're old men. And I was thinking, yeah, I kind of actually didn't really think about that. Like, what are these, those old, these old keezies, like, sitting up there, you know, in the heavens, waiting for the Nishnabe to pray? You know, like, they're, then I was thinking, well, hey, we have seven clans. And that, and that teaching came and he said, you know, those animals were the ones that first taught us. They were the ones that all came forward to give us a gift. And they all taught us something very, very important on how to, how to be together, how to live together. You know, and, um, and it was those, those are the grandfathers, those animals. And here we're in a time where all of our animals, like all the animals are in jeopardy too. So there's nothing, we have nothing to lose by by um, strengthening what's already ours. And, and um, yeah, so we are thinking about all you guys, you know, and we're, we're making a space. And we really believe in if you build it, they will come, and it's going to be a good space for everybody. And I encourage you all to come August 15th to 19th of this coming year. Which twenty great speakers, eh? Yes. How many people know their clans? Quite a few, which is good. We're going to uh, really look at the clan system this year, and because we 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 wanted to, uh, we know that our clans need us. They need us more now than ever before. There was a time when they when they. But they, uh, they felt that they, they needed us. Now we, now we really need them. There was a time in creation when, when they were, when they felt that we were going to be gone from the space of the earth, that the Creator didn't want us anymore, as we were not living our ways. The animals got together around this lake, and they, uh, they each of them said, what are we going to do when, when they're gone? When our two ladies are going to be gone? Us, we have to start thinking about them. And so each of them, the bears, the fish, the wing, the crawlers, the plants, the trees, they all said what they were going to give, give, to, give to us, of themselves, for us. So now we have to, now that they've They've given us all that we need. We need the plants, we need the trees for our medicines. We need the bears, we need the, the fish, we need the eagles, the flyers, we need the crawlers. We need them all. And so we really need to start thinking of them, of how, how they turn one, one, one time that they, they gave up themselves. So now we, we have to start thinking of their needs too. And in that, we have to know who we are, to know where we came from, to know where we're going. We have to know that. When I, um, when I first um, became to understand who I am as Nishnabe Nishnabe Kwe, at the time I, I didn't want to be a Nishnabe Kwe, I wanted to be a Mokshtiye Kwe, because I, uh, I was ashamed of myself. So in 1967, I, I began to understand that I was Nishnabekwe. 
And so I, uh, I moved to Sudbury, and there I, I lived for, for a little bit, and began to, uh, to go and visit my uncle, my uncles in Saigama, Hubert and Dominic, my aunt, and Sarah, and to visit them very, very often, as often as I could, so they could teach me what it is to be Nishnabe. And my auntie would always say, don't forget to come back. Every time I, I left, she would always say, don't forget to come back. And he was just saying that in the language, he was always with Ketuk's copy in Kira. Yeah. You know, Yeshu Chigain, we, we must not forget to come back to our teachings. I was saying we went to, to this territory that we're at right now, Sault Ste. Marie, Bautin. that is also a very sacred place. For those of you that live here, I want to say we wish to be used for allowing us to be here on this beautiful land. And our grand chiefs, our, our chiefs that are with us too, I want to say we wish to them for their, for their leadership. I want to say we wish to all of you for, for being here, for listening to, to us in our humble ways. How we, uh, we as Anishinaabe people have to help each other. We have to work together. Can't work in isolation anymore. When you think about the water, our water is so precious that we may, may one day be without it. But like I said this morning, there was a time when, when, the, when, the, when the songs were given to us there's a song that, that says in the there's a, a third third level where the water is kept by by the Swagamikwe. She's the center of the lake woman. She's the one who takes care of that water. When the time comes all we have to do is ask for that water. And she will she will bring us that water when we really need it. So we, in the prophecies that we we have to listen to our prophecies. How they're how they they taught to us. That's when I when I was sun dancing. I was sun dancing in 19 in the year 2000. I was a sun dance. I wasn't sun dancing then. I was just there as a participant. And the prophecy was that 30 years from now, an ounce of water is going to cost as much as an ounce of gold if we continue with our negligence. And that prophecy, prophetic words, the one little word, if, if we continue with our negligence, that's what's going to happen. I thought about, thought about it for a long time because when he finished talking, he said, what are you going to do about it? I thought he was looking straight at me when he said that, but he was looking at the whole crowd. And then I thought, the little word, if, if we continue with our negligence, that's what's going to happen. So I turned it around and I said, if we discontinue our negligence, that little word, if, if we discontinue our negligence, there's so much we could do to change the world, the world around. And so I, I talked to different people along the way. Two and a half years it took me. People didn't understand what I was talking about. Talked to them about their bundles. The women have to start picking up their bundles, he had said. And if people didn't know that what I was talking about. It wasn't until 2004 that I began to realize what was what was really what the words were were meant, <coughs> what were meant by those words. That women have to start picking up their bundles. I began to understand why, because each of us have to really understand why why we're, we've got our bundles with us. The men have their bundles; they've got their physical bundles. Us women, we are carriers of the water. We are carriers. The water that we carry is our bundle. And in that bundle is the pregnancy when we're pregnant. Nine months we carry that, that bundle with us. And when, when, we, when we hear the hear the little voice of the child within us, we know that things have to change. We have to start thinking about how this little life is going to, to be, be coming out in the, after nine months through water, because through the water is where, where the, the little life, life was, was living. And when the water breaks, then we know that life is going to come. 
We know that, that the baby will come after the water breaks. Same with springtime, when it's springtime, when the sun, when the sun shines on, on the earth and, and the water breaks, we know that water is going to start, start flowing. We know that life is going to start coming out. We know little, little animals will start running around, little bears, little skunks, little porcupines. All these little, little, little humans will be, will be floating around. And so I know that when, when, when he, when he said that, I knew that our bundles is our, our bundles. And when the baby, baby comes out of the womb, after nine months, the water breaks the nine months, and then the baby comes, and then that's our bundle that we carry. We have to really precious, precious bundle that we carry within us. During that time, the nine months is when, when the woman, women and the men have to t start taking care of the bundle that is inside, inside the womb. The father has to start talking to the baby, start, start feeling the baby that is with, within the womb. And so we, we all have a responsibility for the, for the life that is within us. And the same thing with our mother, the earth, when she when she gives life, we have to think about what she's going to be producing for us. All the plants, all the animals, the, the little, little, little babies that are going to come. We have to start thinking of those little bottles that are going to be hers, hers and only hers. We're also part of that bundle too. We have to start thinking about how, how we as humans have to start, start taking care of each other. Start taking care of the four legged, the crawlers, the water kingdom. Us two legged have to work together. I don't care who, what color you are, what color skin you are. We have to start, start thinking about each other, helping each other. And when I think about how, how we as the, as as women have to start picking up our bundles, we have, there's so much we gotta learn. We gotta learn. When, because when when Mother Earth gives us what she what she's what she's been given given by Creator to do, there's strawberries that are the first food that she gives to us is the strawberries, and that strawberry is that gift of life that Creator brought down to the earth, to the vine that He brought down, and He said, "I will give her give her my heart." He gave He gave their daughter his heart and grandmother moon is also the caretaker of, of, the, of the waters she's she she works every month when she's in her fullness we have to honor her and so when we when we think about all of these things how we're so connected to everything everything in the universe we're all connected to the sun the grandfather's son grandmother moon their daughter mother earth she's our mother when we were brought down to this earth, we were given that awesome responsibility to take care of her. That's all we have to do is take care of her. And she will take care of us. She's taking care of us all these, all these years that I can think of. She's given us her food through the, through the animals, the medicines through the bear, all the things, the fish that we eat, everything that we have, the medicines from the trees. We, with the medicines that we use, the sage, all the medicines that we, we can think of. He's given us all the things that we need. So it's our, our turn now to take care of her because she really needs to take care of we need you know, She already needs to take care of her. She's crying now. She's really fighting, fighting for her life. You won't see that she's, she's really causing a lot of, a lot of mayhem. The fires in California, even the landslides and the floods. She's cleaning herself. She's doing everything to clean herself. And it's up to us to tell the people, especially the ones that don't know what's going on. They think it's it's uh, it's monetary economics. They look at economics how it's going to cost them to, to rebuild rebuild the the infrastructures, the buildings and the roads that they have to build. They're not thinking about how Mother Earth is crying. She's uh, trying to fix herself. If we could just really help them understand, they could just be sitting here in these empty chairs, 
these white people that, that don't know what's going on, if they could just sit here and really listen to what, we, 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 what we're saying to them. They could understand what Mother Earth is doing. She's cleaning herself. We're all united with, with the universe. So if we could understand that, it would really be, be so much so much helpful. And so when, when I heard that, I I talked to, to different people about about the bundles. And then when we started walking, I uh, began to, to understand what, what, what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing in the beginning. We didn't know what we were doing. We just we just said let's let's just do it, let's walk around. Lake Superior. That was our, our our goal was to walk around Lake Superior. But the second day we started walking, we we were we were uh, an old man got out of his vehicle because he was the water song was being or the traveling song was being sung to us by by this man and his son and his grandson. They came at the big drum and they stopped us on the road to do travel song for us. This old man got out of his vehicle and he, and he came and stood by, by, the, by the drum after he finished. After the drum finished, he came and he, he said, when I was just knee high, he said, my grandfather told me there would come a time when there'd be women walking around the five great lakes. He, he said, and he said he was really moved by what, what he saw. He gave us an eagle feather. We put that on, on the pill. I look at the young man standing beside me. Does that mean we have to walk around the five great lakes? Because I don't know. Because it was really, really hard for me. I was the only one walking, walking with the pill and the staff at the same time. And he couldn't because he was he had to drive the vehicle. And the other girl who, who was with us, she was at the moon time, so she couldn't walk either. So the third day, we had Violet come all the way from Saskatchewan. She flew flew to Duluth and she got picked up in Duluth. So the Wednesday she was she was she started walking on Thursday. And so that gave us gave me a rest. While well, she walked in, I, I drove the vehicle and Mario and Violet did a walk up to north up to Duluth. So that was our first First attempt at, at, at the water walk, we didn't know what we were doing. We we slept we slept in cars the second day. The third day, in the, on Thursday night, we we, we stopped at this uh, park. We built a uh, tent where we slept. And then in Duluth, the Lord Wyvern came and he he bought a room for us at the hotel. So they were they were at least they had place. Place, one, one place to sleep for the night. So it was, that's how it was all the way through. We went through to Thunder Bay and people there just started helping out. We didn't have any, didn't have any, any, any media, no television, no, no cell phones. We didn't have any, we didn't know about how, how to go about those things. So we got to do to Thunder Bay the Ontario Native Women's Association came and helped out with the rooms, and they, uh, they they raised some funds. We were able to get to continue on. And so, when I think about how how we as as humans, when we're when we're governed by something to do, we just do it, and without even money, we can ask for any money. We can ask for any donations from from the government. As we know, if you if you ask for something from the government, you have to really report everything that you use the money for. How much toilet paper did you use? How much food did you eat? You have to to report everything. So we didn't want to do that. And before we started walking, we went and visit a couple of elders. Went to Emo, or went to Rapids. Went to visit Al Hunter and Annie Wilson. They gave us their blessing that we were doing a good thing. And so Al Hunter said, take lots of socks with you. And Annie Wilson said she, she said she was really, really happy we're doing it. So we, in 2003, we started walking. I remember the first, the first day that we were, it was Monday morning. We went to the water to pick up the water. Was, there was ice 
lots of ice on the water. And then we, we had to jump over the ice poles to get to the water. We got the water to peel. We were standing there praying. Then we turned around, our ice floor had already flown away. We didn't know how we were going to get back to the to the uh, to the mainland. And the wave came, and, and, the, and the wave pushed the pushed the ice floor we were standing on. We were able to to get back to the mainland. My sister was really scared because she's she's afraid of water. She didn't know how she was going to swim. So anyway, we we made it. That was the water that we we walked with. Lake Superior water. So when we uh, when we uh, when we do something, we have to offer tobacco. We offer tobacco for for the work that we are going to be doing. And every time we we have to we have to give blessings to the water to food food for the for food and water. We have to give a food food bundle. We do that every time we, we go we go we go to a lake and we're going to walk around we offer give an offering to the water with tobacco and the food food one was rice, the corn, the deer meat or moose meat or whatever or fish and strawberries and tobacco that's the bundle that we make. And so when we when we offer that, we, we, we also tell the water what we're going to be doing to the water. We're going to offer the water, we're going to walk around the lake with the water. And so when we, uh, when we, we do what we're going to be doing, we don't know what we're going to be doing. So when, when you're asked to do something by the Spirit, you're being invited by the Spirit, you have to do it. Just do it, don't ask any questions. And so when we, when we walked, I remember um, Bob Bob Bully mentioned this morning about the uh, was it this morning or yesterday morning, one of the mornings anyway. He walked with us and he was it was in I think it must have been two thousand and four, two thousand and five he walked with us. And these these guys, redneck guys in a big white truck drove by and they said get a job, and, he, and we just laughed about it, and I looked at Bob, and he said, if they only knew how much money I made, he said, yeah. so, these guys told me, they're farmers, they don't even make any money, but, so we, we laughed about that, we didn't, uh, we didn't get offended by, by those things that they tell us. So many times we, we, we've, we've come across many, many things that, that people don't understand. I remember one time we, we were, um, I think it was in Michigan, we were, no, it was Lake Erie, we were walking to Lake Erie. There was these, these media guys, came and they walked with us. They said they were walking with us, they were walking behind the girls walking. The old and the girls, and they were making fun of them. They said, "Are you married? You want to get married?" The girls just kept walking. They, they laughed about what those guys were saying. So when we when we when we finished when we finished for a day, we laughed about how how those guys really wanted wanted them to to marry one of them. So I was. Uh, and we, that day too, we, we came across, we went to a restaurant to get some coffee. The guys really made fun of us. They said, you guys are crazy. Yeah, we're crazy. I know, we know we're crazy, we told them. Who would, who would be in their right mind to walk around the, the lakes with a pail and the staff? So we, we just agreed with them. They, they don't say anything when we, when we agreed with them. They try to make fun of us. So when we, uh, when we do things, we have to really be patient, patient with people. If they don't understand what, what we're doing, we have to really be humble in what we're doing. Not to create any, any roughness, not to start, start an argument. And I remember one time when we were in Michigan. We were, we were headed towards uh, the, towards the Road Mackinac Bridge. 
And there was this, uh, this young man walking with me. And we saw this big truck stop by ahead of us. And this guy walked out of his vehicle and he, he walked towards us. I thought he was going to greet us, but he said he was really angry. He said, get that, get that effing, effing flag off of that, of that staff, he said. Because we, we had the, the, the Canadian flag on top and he wanted the American flag on top. We, we had we had American flag and Canadian flag on the on the staff that we were carrying, and he he tried to pull the staff away from from the young man. The young man was really he said he almost hit that hit that guy, and he said no don't I said don't do it because we're not we're not here to to cause any 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 grievance. And I told the guy that we were we were there for the water. He said, I don't care about the water, get that effing, effing staff out of here, he said. So really, and so we just kept walking. We, he, he was walking behind us, we kept walking. He got in his vehicle and he drove off. And I remember I had a, I had an eagle whistle. And I, I blew the whistle. Because when I was given that eagle whistle, I was told that that eagle whistle was to, to use that eagle whistle whenever I needed it. So I needed it that time. So I blew the whistle and we stopped for lunch. We stopped on the highway, beside the highway, there's nice grass there. We stopped, put a blanket out and we put food we had, we put on the, on the blanket. A car pulled over, an old beat up truck we stopped by and this old man got out, got out of his vehicle. And he said his name was Running Deer. We knew he was a, he was a veteran, the way he looked. And he had a ribbon shirt, blue ribbon shirt on. And he stayed with us for till we finished lunch and then he took off again. And so when we got to the next town we, we told about this we went to this grocery store and got some got some food supplies. We we told him about this this guy that stopped by by us. And he said, can't be running here, running there, he said. He died two years ago. And I told him, he was driving an old beat-up truck. He says, yeah, he used to have an old beat-up truck. We don't know how how he must have came. I don't know how he must have came, came to us when we needed him. So things like that happened to us when we were water walking. We don't know what, what, we're, going, what, we're, what we're expected to do or how we're going to be guided by the spirits, how we're going to be... And I remember how, how women have their dreams about the waters. I've had a lot of a lot of women come to me or call me or, or email me about their visions, their dreams about the waters. And I, I tell them that that to, just to follow their dreams, to keep keep on what they what they're dreaming about. And so when I think about how how we as um, when we finished the five great lakes we we, we went to a Cornwall, Cornwall meeting and I, it was Henry Lickers was there and he said, Josephine, you finished the five great lakes, you're not finished yet. He said, the five great lakes go to St. Lawrence River. And he said, I went home and I told my sister what, what Henry Lickers said. He said, why doesn't Henry Lickers walk to St. Lawrence River? He said, <laughs> well, so the following year we did the St. Lawrence River and we started getting stuff. Cornwall. And Henry Chris met us there and he, he put us up in a hotel. We walked to St. Lawrence River. We finished that Madeline, Riviera de Madeline is what it's called, where we, we felt the water was really salty there. So we, we finished what we were doing. And so when we finished, we thought we were finished and we had another 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 dream that came to a woman in the East Coast. She said she had a dream that the salt waters were to be brought together. So we had to do the, the, the salt waters in 2011. 2011 we, we did, the, we did the, uh, the four Great Lakes. The four salt waters were brought together to the St. Lawrence River. And people ask why salt water, because salt water is, is really good for healing. 
heals the waters. And I know because I use salt water when I when I take a bath sometimes I put salt water and sea salt water in my bath and I feel really good after that. So we, we did the we did the four oceans. The the, the east, the west, the north and the south. We brought them together to sit to the to stay to the lake superior. When you're guided by the Spirit, you don't ask questions. You just you just go ahead and do what you're doing, what you need to be doing. And I know Edward. Edward has has done the water journey by canoe. I remember when I when I when I saw him, I went I went to. He didn't have anybody to help him. I drove all night. Wanted to help him with this with this canoe journey. And he, he went on his canoe and I saw him. I still see that picture of him in his canoe all by himself. And I, and I, it, it disappeared in the distance. He was on his way to, I don't know where he was going that day. To here, well, to succeed where he, but it was at the, uh, Lake Huron in Kettle Point, actually Stony Point. That's where he, he took off. And I really, really felt that I really needed to be there to support him. But he needed he needed the help. That's so why I followed him for a few days made sure he was okay. I, I made sure that I saw him every once in a while in the water. I would find a place where, where he would be water, where the water would be. And he would he would come in the, and bring his canoe out. And so that that was how he started his his canoe journey. That was the he was that the, 2016. And so when when we uh, when we walked the the same we walked from the loop to the Tate Quebec this past year. That was my last water walk. I couldn't walk anymore, I can't walk anymore. Been diagnosed with Parkinson's. So hey, that was my last water walk. I tried to walk as much as I could but I there's times I couldn't walk. I just drove the the big white van that we rented on on Native Women's Association loan us the van or pay for the van. We were able to, to use a, a good van that time. And so when we uh, when we do something we have to to really finish what we're doing. And so I don't know what 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 the what the next next chore will be for me to do, but we have a book now that Joanne Joanne finished the book, and I think it will be with children that I have to work with children. I'm not sure. I have to wait and see. So I don't know what, but it's not. They say the end is always a beginning. And when I see, when I see the finishing, finishing of the water walk that I've been doing, it's not the end, it's the beginning of something that I'm not, I'm not sure what it will be. With that, I want to say miigwech for you listening. Miigwech. So we'll open it up for questions. Uh, come step up to the mic if you have a question for the panelists. I've got the first question uh, for Autumn. So last fall you were nominated as a, and you were a finalist for the International Children's Peace Prize. How did that make you feel? It made me feel really proud that I was nominated for this big award. But then I also thought to myself, it's okay if I don't win because there's other children doing great work out there too. 
but it was a huge honor to be nominated for this award. All right, congratulations. Round of applause to Autumn for that. Awesome. Any questions? Step up to the microphone. I see a rush for the microphone. Full contact microphone. Laura, microphone number one. Josephine, in your work and uh, your walks around the Great Lakes, how do you see the waters now? Has do you see healing taking place? Very much so. I see. In 2003, I stopped by this lake. It was really dead. It was there was not no movement. It was just algae around the lake. I went and, and prayed for that water. I put tobacco, put tobacco in the water. And as the tobacco flowed, I started. It started to move. The water started to move. With the tobacco, the tobacco started floating around. I knew that that the water was was listening to what I was saying to it. I sang to it and I talked, talked to it and I told, I told the water that I would take care. Of. We would take care of her. We would love her. And so when I, I went back the following year, 2004, and I saw that water was really alive. It was just starting to have waves in the water. So I know the water is, is, uh, is taking care of itself. And I know that the water that, that Lake Superior, the water that flows from Lake Superior is Lake Nipigan. Lake Nipigan has uh, three, they say there's three, three, three underground waters there. And, and the water flows from, from Lake Nipigan to, to Lake Superior. So it cleans the water. And I've noticed the water is really starting to get clear. I don't know about Lake, Lake Erie, though, because Lake Erie was, was really, really, um, really dirty that time that we were there in 2006, 2007. It was, there was, we see dead animals in the water, we see dead fish. We saw an otter, otter in a, uh, in a fishing line. So we, we knew that the water was really, really sick. But they said that the water was, was clearing up. I haven't been there for a while, so I don't know. But I know the water is really, really taking care of itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Grand Council Chief. Not so much a question, I just want to share a story. Uh, the deputy and I were supposed to meet uh, Josephine when she was traveling through the Nipissing area by our office. And we were down in uh, Peterborough, Curve Lake area for uh, a youth conference. So we said, well, we'll catch up to Josephine before uh, she gets too far down the highway. So uh, she was on her way to Bad River. So. Uh, we were down at the youth conference for a couple of days. By the time we caught up to her, she was almost to Bad River. Like, I didn't realize she could motor so fast there when she was going down the road yeah. carrying that pail. And, uh, and then what was really uh, just a, a big moment for the deputy and I, like it was just, we were just in, uh, in awe. She was just close to the end of the uh, walk uh, to go to the lodge there in Bad River, and uh, we came up in the van behind and uh, a, a black bear went running across the road right behind him. And I said, wow, what a powerful message, you know, the healing of, uh, you know, the work she's doing about healing for water. And there goes the bear who symbolizes healing going right behind. I don't know if you ever did see that bear, Josephine, but uh, the bear went by and then we, we passed them and then we, uh, you know, we were there to, you know, greet them with everybody else when they, when they got to the lodge there in Bad River. But I just wanted to share that little story about uh, you know, just how the creator works in so so great ways there uh, you know have that black bear come there and uh, right at the end of her journey at the bad river and uh, you know josephine has nothing to fear from that bear because that bear couldn't catch her <laughs> laura did you have another question <clears throat> yes 
This one is for Edward. Do, what do you have planned for next summer by way of canoeing? Do you have any trips or journeys uh, planned? That's a good question. Uh, while we were traveling, we realized in stopping the communities, we realized that most communities have a very, very large canoe. A, a Gmon that's just been waiting, like 30 foot canoes that never, like they haven't been out and a lot of them are still good to go. And we had this, I just, this brilliant thing came over me like, you know, she's already set the path and I think that might be a, the best way to, the next step would be to have a canoe gathering and have multiple journeys just like the Four Directions walk and ask the communities to send, you know, a team to come and, to come and learn more about the canoe and, and to have that shared experience and to also encourage you know, young people and, and people in our communities to come together on those traditional highways. Uh, I think we, that seems like the best way to go, but uh, these, like what Joseph's been saying with the spirit, you can't really force those things, like that's an idea, but we really have to know what's what's there, like what's, and a lot of people over in uh, the States, like a lot of our relatives over there, they're really big into canoeing and they're, they're building birch bark canoes, they work with, you know, so how do we share that and how do we return return those bundles, like that bundle, have, and we're still working on it, but I think next year is going to be, or this year, like I'm going to be really busy with the uh, clan gathering, so I, I imagine the next canoeing would be, would be the year after. Thank you very much, Edward, and we look forward to hearing more about the clan gathering in August. So be much. Autumn, this question is for you. What do you have planned in, uh, by way of upcoming uh, events or gatherings that you will be attending? What are you doing? Um, what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> Um, today I'm traveling to Toronto, and tomorrow I'm going to Queen's Park to uh, um, receive the Governor General's Award um, for volunteers and some, I think it's something like that. Oh, Thank you very much. And Autumn, on, our, on behalf of our conference, here's a little uh, gift for you. Miigwech. A round of applause, Autumn Peltier. And my today's brother, Mr. Edward George, there you go, English. And Josephine, I've got something special for you. I've got a token of our appreciation here as well. But there's a special one here for you. It's a nice big, it uh, looks like a jacket. But there is a, uh, a copper cup in here. They want you to take a look at it. If you can open it up. Got an etching on it. I will do it for the water. So very nice. A round of applause for Josephine. Well, what a wonderful panel and a great way to uh, to finish off the formal portion of our uh, of our conference. By way of applause, I want everybody to applaud. Did you have a good conference? Let's hear your voice and let's hear your applause. I want to encourage you, before you, uh, you leave, I want you to fill out a, an evaluation form. They're very important. Just leave it on the table if you can, but fill it all out. Uh, the Anishinaabek Nation, uh, uh, the health secretary, wants to have that feedback from you in order to make this conference better in the future and to improve on it. But do you want to come back next year? Was this a good enough conference to happen again? Yeah, very nice. 
How about a big round of applause, please, for our conference organizers, for Priscilla, for Jamie, for Cynthia, for Stephanie, and all those involved. Good job, you wish. I want to call upon our Grand Council Chief, uh, Pat Patrick Madabi, to come up and uh, offer us some final words uh, as we uh, make our way home into our communities. He has no prepared speech. This is just all off the cuff. Oh, well, he doesn't have Chief uh, Sayers' notes to steal this time. But he's got Bernster at uh, Champs' uh, notes, I'm sure. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> well, I want to thank everyone for coming. Again, it's been a great uh, health conference for Nishnabek. And uh, we've got lots of work to do ahead, you know, for uh, making things better for people in our communities. But with all your great efforts and, uh, you know, uh, we have some great staff that work with us as well, and I want to thank all of them for uh, the organizing of this event, and, uh, and thank you, Bob, for uh, uh, being our facilitator, and Jamie, with you and your team, uh, another uh, successful conference. Be much. I want to acknowledge uh, the other uh, Nishnabek health programs that are here, and uh, of course, this is an important part of uh, getting the message out, so on behalf of the Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Program and the HIV AIDS Program, and uh, all the other programs that are part of the uh, Nishnabek Asian Health Secretariat, uh, thank you very much for being a part of this, and I'll turn it over to your director, Jamie Restul. Bob, I want to say thanks first to everyone who uh, took time out of your very busy schedules to come and uh, share your experiences, your knowledge, and to learn from one another here during our third annual health conference. We hope you're all back next year. Uh, we're looking forward to, to building even bigger and better for our conference next year. So thank you guys for all being here. And just uh, for my final note, I want to thank our MC for this week, Bob, who's done an excellent job again. <laughs> Bob mentioned it when he opened opened up the conference that he had some uh, battles with the weather to get down here. His flight schedule didn't quite work, and he put in a lot of extra hours just to get down here and be here with us. Uh, even aside from that, uh, we want to thank him for all his hard work that he's uh, and his leadership that he shared with us this week. We have a uh, some tokens of appreciation for Bob, and we also have some tokens of appreciation for Bob's wife Deborah. His, when Bob's here with us, he's away from home, so we appreciate his uh, efforts here, and we acknowledge uh, his, his not being home with his uh, family as well. So we have a uh, smudge kit and a copper cup and a couple of other little treats in here for him. So thanks so much, Bob. We appreciate all of the work that you do for us here. All right, I got one too. Oh, great. And my wife is probably glad you take me away from home. <laughs> So much easier. So that uh, brings us to the end. I'm going to uh, ask uh, the uh, Healing Lodge singers, Teresa, can you bring your uh, group up to uh, offer us our final song and uh, our final.